Number one, is there, uh, within the scientific community, I mean, there's these different inklings across sectors. I mean, we saw it in the teacher strikes, as an example, and, the, uh, you know, and obviously people facing much more raw economic pressure. But is there some sense of uh, politicization in these communities as a result of this environment? I don't think it's, I mean, I think that the answer is yes, but also not enough, right? right. So one of the things about science workers is that, um, like many academics, notoriously hard to organize. So teachers, funny, people talk about yeah. education and logistics and hospitals as basically being contemporary factories. So you have Amazon warehouses that are, look actually quite similar to factories, and then you have, but you also have, you have schools and you have hospitals, and these are places where workers sort of all work in really similar conditions. They work in, um, you know, facilities, in bounded facilities, and they're able to sort of communicate with each other. And that might be why we see the teacher strikes and we see, um, you know, nurses are some of the more militant workers in the yep. labor movement. Yep. Um, and you also see, you know, attempts to organize logistics workers, you know, UPS workers, Amazon, Amazon workers, and things like that. But academics are funny. They're in a kind of a liminal space because they're both to some they're both workers in these big sort of like nouveau factory like settings the university is certainly one of those but they're also you know middle class professionals who are essentially curators of their own brand selling their own labor on a market and being their own sort of brand ambassadors which is quite different from you know how a nurse works in a hospital and to some extent you you lose solidarity among workers yeah. when they're sort of looking out for themselves and so i think that that's been a major complaint about um, the ability to organize academics against some of these things. And it's also true that it's not obvious who the boss is that you're supposed to put pressure on. I mean, essentially, it comes down to probably the root. The root is like a combination of university administrations, which continue to impose these neoliberal performance metrics, and then the federal government itself, which continually cuts off funding to universities as well as state governments. Um, right. But it's when you don't have solidarity and you don't have people thinking of themselves as workers and you don't have them thinking of themselves as, you know, a united class that's facing a collective problem as opposed to individual problems, it's very hard to attack those. It's very hard to stand up to those, you know, root causes and those those major agents of um, of the problem, right? Absolutely. Final question, I, and this is on my mind. I just completed, just recorded earlier today a uh, dissection for Michael Brooks show of this uh, new Steve Pinker book. And there's a lot of problems in it. And one of the things that struck me is that right now, and this is, this is actually another great example of the real problem in public discourse of not having marks in the game. And I'm not even saying, you know, mm. whatever people can be Marxist or not Marxist, whatever. But the, the, this positioning that so many of the, because People like Steve Pinker who evangelize for this thing called science, quote unquote, are positioning themselves against, you know, reactionaries and religious fanatics or whoever else who sort of deny basic scientific realities and also in a more, you know, serious way can gun for, you know, educational curriculums, attack public health. I mean, those are serious policy issues. Uh, and then on the other hand, there's this caricature of a sort of you know, ridiculous postmodernist position, which might exist in some area. It, it's a combination of first, in some ways, misrepresenting people's positions, and then in other ways, like, yes, maybe you could find like an assistant anthro professor at some college somewhere who said, you know, that, that, uh, I don't know, you know, who made like some ludicrous blank slate argument or something that denied you know, certain things that we have discovered about, I don't, I don't know, you know, uh, how brains work, or whatever. And it's totally over exaggerated and also used as a cudgel by people like Pinker to not deal with the politics of science and, and, and negate really important conversations about race and gender and class and so on. But at the same time, because there isn't any of this foundational understanding of how literally the scientific enterprise happens from an actual material point of view and what actually drives it, you have a position where the people who are sort of primarily identified with in the public mind with being the brand's ambassadors and asserters of science 
have nothing to say. In fact, to an extent that they do have anything to say, they're part of the problem you're identifying because they buy market logic on everything. So as part of parcel of their call for science is also this push towards the neoliberalization, which will you know, be used on behalf of corporations, not people, and also make us miss out on actual breakthroughs and in innovation because of the environment you described. And to me, I think that is because a materialist analysis isn't in play. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that this is a false dichotomy between the sort of like reactionary forces of the contemporary dark age who don't believe in science. And then there's like somehow the, the real defenders of science who also happen to be pro-capitalist and pro-neoliberal and pro-austerity and pro-market logic. I mean, we have to basically say, no, actually, those two positions can be collapsed into one another to some extent. And yes. then we can stake out a second position, which is that we are so pro-science socialists, right? We, we actually care about public funding and we care about um, eliminating the, uh, the dominance of the profit motive over science because we care about science and because we think it's important and we want to protect it. And then I'll circle back around and explain that a little bit better when I say that those two things can be collapsed together, the sort of like pro, pro-capitalist pro position and the sort of reactionary anti-science um, position the former feeds the latter. And this is something that Edwards and Roy get into in their in their article. They wrote, I'm just going to read a quote. Um, they're talking about the potentially catastrophic effects of this neoliberal marketization and privatization on science itself. And they write, the combination of perverse incentives and decreased funding increases pressures that can lead to unethical behavior. If a critical mass of scientists become untrustworthy, a tipping point is possible in which the scientific enterprise itself becomes inherently corrupt and the public and the public loses trust, risking a new dark age with devastating consequences to humanity. So you see how fake news. The if it, yeah, if you have exactly, and if you have, and you're, and the the point that I'm trying to make is that the sort of like rosy go along with capitalism, go along with marketization kind of position is actually really playing with fire. Um, in terms of this contemporary dark age anti-science attitude, because it's possibly eroding the integrity of the scientific endeavor. And if we care about the integrity of the scientific endeavor and public trust in science, what we're going to have to do is publicly fund science and protect it for the public well-being as opposed to just simply for private profit. Megan Day, the piece is capitalism is ruining science. Keep, uh, cre- a creeping marketization has created perverse incentive structures for researchers threatening the Wholesale Corruption of Science Itself. It's in Jacobin. It's an incredibly important piece, as really, I mean, I, I basically think all your pieces are. So, Megan Day, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for doing this. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.